delight to uh, be back again tonight. You know, he was talking about Al Fausch. Al is uh, uh, the business manager in our church, and I have known him since the uh, early 70s when he came here from Iowa to go to Wake Forest University. And he came to Christ in our church, and uh, then later we called him back to be our business manager. So it's great to have him with me tonight. And I'm glad to be back with you. How many of you were here last week? Okay, how many of you were not here last week? Okay, a few of you, all right, well good. Well tonight, uh, my topic is dealing effectively with our failures. Uh, I believe, are you guys gonna uh, advance that from the back? If you want to, that's fine with me, and I'll just kind of count on you having it up there, okay? It, 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 we'll see if that works. If it doesn't, I've got this, and I'll do it, I'll do it tonight, okay? Uh, I believe that there are two essentials to successful relationships in the family, or out of the family, for that, for that matter. The first essential is that the individuals feel loved and appreciated. I talked about that when I was with you, I don't know, a year or so ago. Uh, when people feel loved and appreciated, husbands and wives, parents and children, then uh, there's going to be a long-term healthy relationship. That's one of the essentials. Now, you will know that it is possible to have a long-term marriage and not have a healthy marriage. There are people who live together for 30 years, and so they have a long-term marriage, but they don't have a healthy marriage. If it's going to be long-term and healthy, they must love each other in a language that the other person will feel and understand. And uh, that's when I addressed the five love languages when I was with you a year or so ago, okay? The second essential, however, is that the individuals will deal effectively with their failures. And that's what I want to address tonight, that we have to deal effectively with our failures. Now, the reason I say that is because none of us are perfect. There are no perfect husbands. Now, one man did raise his hand when the pastor said, does anyone know of a perfect husband? He shot his hand right up. He said, my wife's first husband. <laughs> well, the reality is, my observation is, if there are any perfect husbands, they are deceased. And most of them got perfect after they died. The reality is there are no perfect husbands, there are no perfect wives, there are no perfect children, there are no perfect parents. We don't have to be perfect to have healthy marriages and families, but we do have to deal effectively with our failures. Otherwise, we will not have healthy families. So I want to talk to you tonight on this topic, and essentially what this requires is apology and forgiveness. And we're going to look at both of those tonight. Apology and forgiveness. Now, the Bible is very big on this matter of apologizing. Listen to these verses, and you'll see them on the screen. Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Now, that's always true with God. If you try to hide your sins from God, you're not going to prosper. But if you confess your sins to God and you turn from your sins, you'll always find mercy with God. And usually in the family, if you'll confess your failures and you'll turn from your failures, you'll find your spouse will forgive you, your children will forgive you. Same principle is true. But if you don't and you act like everything's okay, I didn't do anything really wrong, then you're not going to prosper in your family relationships. Listen to this verse. Isaiah 59, verse 2. God said, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. You see, when we sin against God, we put a barrier between us and God. And the scriptures say God doesn't hear us. He does, the only prayer God hears when the barrier's there is the prayer of confession. But if we, we just act like nothing's happened, no, there's a barrier there and God doesn't hear. The same thing is true in family life. When a husband screams at his wife and then walks off and acts like everything's all right and that didn't really matter and nothing, no, he put a barrier between the two of them. And the barrier sits there until he's willing to apologize and she's willing to forgive. 
Matthew chapter 5 indicates how strongly Jesus felt about this whole thing. Listen to what Jesus said. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother or your wife or your husband or your child or your parent has something against you, you've sinned against them, leave your gift there in front of the altar First, go be reconciled to your brother and then come back and offer your gift. Now, put that into our context. Jesus said, if you come to church and you're sitting here in church and you realize that you have sinned against your wife or husband or brother or anybody else, leave the church and go be reconciled to the brother and then come back and worship me. Pastor, I've often wondered what would happen on Sunday morning if we practiced that. <laughs> You know, one pastor did tell me, he said, Dr. Chapman, he said, my wife and I were riding to church one morning, and he said, I, I was all uptight, and I, I kind of spoke harshly to my wife, and he said, after that, there was a silence. And then we got to church, and I dropped her off at the door, and she went inside, and I parked the car, and then I went in the church, and he said, I'm sitting there, and the, and the people in the choir are singing, everybody's singing, and, and I know that I'm going to have to get up and preach in a few minutes. And he said, I'm thinking, man, you're the biggest hypocrite in this church. Just yell at your wife in the car. Now you're going to get up and preach to all these people. And he said, I, I just couldn't do it. And he said, I turned around. My wife was in the choir, and I kind of caught her eye, and I motioned to her, and she knew what I meant. And so she went out and met me in the hallway, and I said, Honey, I'm sorry for the way I talked to you in the car. Shouldn't have raised my voice to you like that, and I hope you'll forgive me. And she said, Honey, you know I'll forgive you. And she gave him a big hug. He said, I went back in, and I could preach. See, he was practicing what Jesus taught. I mean, Jesus is big on this thing of dealing with our failures. So here's my question. Where do we learn to apologize? Typically from our parents or someone who served as our parents. Little Johnny pushes his sister down the stairs and mother says, Johnny, you don't do that to sister. Go tell her you're sorry. So little Johnny says, I'm sorry, even if he's not. I'm sorry. He's 23. He sins against his wife. What's he going to do? I'm sorry. Now, some people learn from their parents not to apologize. We found out when we were doing research on this topic, I say we because I wrote this book with Dr. Jennifer Thomas, who is a Christian counselor here in our city. Uh, we found out that about 10% of the population almost never apologizes. And most of them are men. And most of them learn that from their fathers. Their father said, real men don't apologize. Wow. Now, you know where their fathers got that? From John Wayne, that great theologian. <laughs> real men don't apologize. And then some of us, our fathers never told us that but we never heard our fathers apologize. So I remember as a child, eight years old or so, I'm in the back seat of the car, my father's driving, my mother's beside her, beside him, and along the road something came up and my father spoke rather loudly and harshly to my mother, and my mother just clammed up. Looking back on it, I assume that she had learned that if she responded, it'd just get louder, and so she just clammed up. Now, I'm in the back seat as a child, and I'm not feeling real well because the man I admire most in my life has just spoken harshly to the woman I admire most in my life, and it's not a very secure feeling for a child in the back seat. I never heard my father apologize to my mother. I'm not saying he didn't. Maybe he did in private, but I never heard him apologize to my mother. So I came into marriage with no model of apology. My father didn't say, don't apologize. I just never saw a model of it. So some of us have to learn as adults how to apologize. But most of us do learn some form of an apology from our parents. Problem is that we had different parents. So we learn different ways of apologizing. You see, the key question in the back of our minds when we are, when someone's apologizing to us, the key question is, are they sincere? Isn't that what we're asking in our minds? Are they sincere? Or are they just trying to get this out of the way? 
Because if we think they're sincere, we're willing to forgive them. But if they're just trying to get rid of this and, and you know, act like it's not, no big deal, then it's harder for us to forgive them. So we did research for two years trying to find out how people determine whether the person is sincere. And after two years of research, here's what we found. This is what a sincere apology looks like. <laughs> if you can pull this off, they will believe that you are sincere, okay? I know I'm kind of going in and out, it sounds like. If you all want to change this thing, it's okay with me. I'm, I'm flexible. I can talk while we change it and whatever you want to do. But otherwise, I'll just carry on. Uh, well, here's what we really found. We really found that there are five basic ways that people apologize. I, and we call them the five languages of apology. We learn them from our parents. And what I want to do is share these with you because we tend to judge sincerity based on whether or not they're speaking their apology in the language that we think they should be speaking it. So I want to share this with you. All, all five of these are found in the Bible. So let me, let me share them with you. What are the five languages of apology? Number one is expressing regret. Often with the words, I'm sorry. Now, this language is trying to communicate emotionally to the other person that you feel badly about what has happened. You want me to use that, James? Yeah. You think it'd be better? Yeah, okay. Just, Let's just turn, turn that off, will you? There we go. Okay. Testing, one, two, three. Okay, that better? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, expressing regret is trying to communicate to the other person that I really feel badly about what I've done. And often we use the words, I'm sorry. But please don't ever use those two words alone. Tell them what you're sorry for. I'm sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you. I'm sorry that I came home an hour and a half late and we've missed the program. Tell them what you're sorry for. You see, if you simply say, I'm sorry, your spouse may well be thinking, you certainly are. Is there anything else you'd like to say? You say, you think that you're apologizing, and they think you're giving a character report. So tell them what you're sorry for, and don't ever add the word but. I'm sorry that I lost my temper and yelled at you, but if you had not, then I would not, and now you're not apologizing, you're blaming them for your poor behavior. And some of you have a habit of putting that but in there. So I'm going to give you a, a little way of how to break the habit. The next time you hear yourself apologizing and then you say, but, you just stop and say, oh, excuse me, erase the but. And you will not erase it but three or four times and you'll break that habit, okay? So apologizing, one, one language is expressing regret. And this also is in the Bible. Let me give you two examples. Luke chapter 15, verse 21, the prodigal son Listen to what he said to his father. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. You feel the regret in his voice? He, he had squandered all the money his father gave him. He's hungry. He's coming home. He says, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. If you could just give me a job on the farm so I can have something to eat. He deeply regrets what he has done, and he's trying to express that to his father. Psalm 51 verse 17 says, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Anytime you come to God with a broken heart over what you've done and you acknowledge to God that you're sorry for what you have done, and God always knows your heart, God will never turn away from a broken heart. I don't care what sin you've committed. It can be the worst sin you can imagine. But if you come with a broken heart to God, deeply regretting what you have done, God will forgive you. And most of the time, people will forgive you if you come with a broken heart and you come expressing regret over what you have done. So that is the first language of apology, expressing regret. The second apology language is accepting responsibility. I was wrong. Should not have done that. No excuse for that. I accept full responsibility. I was wrong. Now, some of you have difficulty 
saying the words, I was wrong. And the people that have most difficulty are those who grew up in a home where every day their parents told them what they were doing wrong, seldom ever told them what they were doing right. And somewhere in that child's psyche, they grew up with the idea that if I ever get to be big, I'll never be wrong again. And so they have a hard time saying I was wrong because that, makes that, that communicates to them, Mama was right, Daddy was right, I'm no good. Well, the reality is that all of us sin, and we all have to come down off the pedestal and acknowledge we're all sinners, and we all hurt the people we love the most in our families. And so we have to learn to accept responsibility for our behavior. I remember years ago, before I was as spiritual as I am now, I got up one morning and I said to my wife, uh, Carolyn, uh, wh wh where's my briefcase? And she said, I haven't seen it. I said, well, it was in there by the dresser. I mean, you must have moved it. And she said, Gary, I haven't seen your briefcase. I said, Carolyn, think. I know where the thing was. Who else would have moved it? I went on two or three more rounds. I got higher, higher, higher. I was screaming at my wife. Can you believe that? Me, <laughs> screaming at my wife. Now, I was nice to the kids, got the kids in the car, took them to school, you know, have a nice day, da-da-da-da-da. But when I got rid of the kids, I drove from the school to the church where my office is, thinking to myself, how could I have married such a scatterbrained woman? This time, she's lost my briefcase. I don't even know who I'm going to see today. What am I supposed to do today? My whole schedule's in my briefcase. I don't know how I'm going to operate today. How could I have married a woman that just misplaced my briefcase? When I got to church, I did not walk in by the administrative assistants. I went in the back door to my office. Folks, when you have sinned, you don't want to see people. You want to do what Adam and Eve did in the garden, get behind the bush and hope God won't see you. I went in the back door to my office. And when I opened the door and walked into my office, there was my briefcase. Now I have an option. I can say to myself, I'm not going to let her know it was out here. And I can hope she'll forget the ordeal. Or I could practice what I preach. And if I had done the former, I obviously would not be using this for an illustration. So I called her on the phone. Hi, babe. Found my briefcase. She didn't say anything. She knew there ought to be more to it than that. And so I said, uh, I'm sorry for the way I talked to you. I, 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 I was wrong. I didn't say it was easy. Some, some of us have a hard time admitting I was wrong. In fact, why don't, yeah, and you, you know what she said? I thought you'd call. Because we're committed to dealing with our failures. Now, let's just see if you can say that out loud, because I know some of you have never said these words. So let's just say it out loud. I was wrong. Here we go. I was wrong. See, some of you had trouble even on a dry run. I was wrong. Now, the Bible's very big on this also. Listen to these words. Again, the prodigal son, Luke 15, verse 21 I have sinned against heaven and against you. I have sinned. Incidentally, anytime you sin against your husband or wife or a family member, you also sin against God. So we need to confess our sins to God, and then we need to apologize to our family members. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, the word means to agree with. If we agree with God about our sins, then God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. If we're willing to admit that we've sinned, and God is willing to forgive us. And the same principle is true on the human level. Incidentally, this is the first step in teaching children how to apologize effectively. Helping them accept responsibility for their behavior. A three-year-old breaks a cookie and says, it broke. It broke. And the parent says, honey, let's say that a different way. I broke the cookie. I broke the cookie. Not a sin to break a cookie. We're just trying to teach the child to accept responsibility for, he, for her or his, or his behavior. 
Our son was probably six or seven. We were both in the kitchen. He accidentally knocked the glass off the table. It hit the floor and shattered. And I looked at him, and he said, It did it by itself. <laughs> and I said, Derek, let's say that a different way. I accidentally knocked the glass off the table. And he said, I accidentally knocked the glass off the table. Not a sin to accidentally knock a glass off the table. I'm just trying to help him accept responsibility for his behavior. He's not going to grow up to be perfect, and he needs to learn how to accept responsibility for his behavior. I was wrong. And for some people, this is what it means to, to apologize. And if you don't admit that you were wrong, then they have trouble believing that you're sincere. The third language is making restitution or offering to make restitution. What can I do to make this right? My guess is that the good percentage of you who have never even thought of this, let alone done it. Offering to make restitution. I sent the manuscript of this book to a counselor friend of mine in California, and I said, I want you to read this and give me feedback. He wrote back in about a month, and he said, Gary, man, this book has helped me and my wife. He said, you know, we've been married 20 years. And he said, uh, any time that uh, my wife offends me or does something to hurt me, as long as she tells me I'm sorry, I, 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 I regret doing that, he said, it, man, I can forgive her. I, I can let it go. He said, so what have I done for 20 years when I offend her? I tell her that I'm sorry. He said, to me, that's a sincere apology. I'm sorry. But he said, for 20 years, it's always seemed she had a hard time letting it go. I mean, sometimes she'd say, yeah, I forgive you, but he said, I could just tell. It, it, she, could, she couldn't let it go. And he said, we were working through the book, and we got to this one on making restitution. My wife said, that's it. That's what I've been waiting for for 20 years, to hear you offer to make things right. He said, Gary, it never occurred to me to offer to make things right. He said, but now I do, and every time I do, she has an idea. <laughs> now, let me just throw this in, because the nature of the offense will often call for more than one of these languages. If it's a really severe offense, I, I suggest you speak all five of these. Let's say, guys, now you guys would never do this, but let's say that you forget your anniversary. No flowers, no candy, no dinner, nothing. And you're sitting there that night, and you look over on the couch, and she's crying. And you say, honey, what's wrong? And she said, I can't believe you don't know what's wrong. And it dawns on you. I doubt that I'm sorry is going to hack it. But if you tell her, oh, honey, I am so sorry. Oh, honey, I thought about it two days ago. I even thought about it yesterday, and I was going to do it. But, honey, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. But, honey, look, look, I know we can't do anything tonight, but l let me make it up to you. I mean, wh wh we can celebrate on another day, honey. J just give me an idea. What could we do to celebrate? Let me make it up to you. She'll have an idea. A little trip to Hawaii just might do it. Yeah, she'll have an idea. And for some people, this is what they're waiting to hear for you to offer to make things right. Listen to these words in Luke 19 and verse 8. This is Zacchaeus after he encountered Jesus. Lord, if I've cheated anyone, I will pay back four times the amount I took. That is restitution. Incidentally, all of these have tremendous implications for business. You're in a restaurant, and the waiter or the waitress accidentally spills something on your dress or on your coat. And they say, oh, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. And that's all they say. And you're sitting there with the gravy dripping down, thinking, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry too, you know. I mean, you don't have real good feelings about the waitress or, or the restaurant. But if the owner or the manager comes out and says, the waiter or waitress told me what happened, and of course we know it was an accident, but listen, uh, 
we, we want to make this up to you. I mean, this meal is on us. This is the least we can do. And if you'll bring you, you, the, the ticket by when you get it clean, we will be glad to pay to get it clean. You're going to go back to that place. You see, because they showed you not only they were sorry, but they, they offered to make restitution. They, they reached out to do something for you. So this is a powerful uh, language of apology. A fourth language of apology is genuinely repenting or expressing the desire to change. I don't want to keep doing this. I know I did the same thing last week or last month. I don't like this about me. Can we talk? Can you help me? Can we get a plan that I won't do this again? I don't want to keep doing this. You see, you're expressing the desire to change your behavior. You know what the word repent means? To turn around. You're walking in this direction, you repent, you walk in this direction. So we turn away from our sin and express the desire to change our behavior. And again, for some people, this is what it means to apologize. And if you don't express the desire to change your behavior, then in their mind, you have not apologized. Dr. Thomas was sharing this concept with her mother. And her mother said, well, honey, I can give you a perfect example of that at work. She said, I have a friend at work. We've been friends for 15 years. I mean, close friends. But I noticed that for the last two or three days, th this friend had been kind of cold. And so we were on break one day, and I said to her, is everything all right between you and me? That's the way friends talk to each other. Is everything all right between you and me? And she said, my friend said to me, you know what I don't like about you? You don't ever apologize. And her mother said, I was shocked. And I said, what, what, what do you mean? And she said, you remember three weeks ago when you did da-da-da-da-da? And she said, yes, I remember that, but I told you I was sorry. And the lady said, I know, but you, but you didn't ask me to forgive you. Ooh, she said. Well, then let me ask you to forgive me because I value your relationship. And she, and, and she said, will you please forgive me? And the lady said, sure. You see, it wasn't that she did not want to forgive her, it's in her mind her mother had not asked her to forgive me. Which leads, which, well, let me give you the verse on the, on the other one first. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. The Bible's big on, for, on repentance, okay? And then the next language is the one I just illustrated, that is requesting forgiveness. Will you please forgive me? That's what the lady was wanting to hear she was wanting to hear her mother ask her to forgive her. Now, some of you will think, well, Gary, why would you have to ask them to forgive you? I mean, don't they know if you're apologizing that you want to be forgiven? So why would you have to ask for forgiveness? Well, because some people, in their mind, this is what it means to apologize. You ask for forgiveness. Now, you don't have to simply use those words, will you forgive me? You can say, I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me. I value our relationship, and I hope you can forgive me. Because ultimately, if they don't forgive you, the relationship's not going forward. So you're hoping that they will forgive you. Psalm 51, verse 2, listen to the words of David. He says to God, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Three different ways he's asking God to forgive him. Can I go back and give you an example on the, on the genuinely repenting? I had a lady in my office, and I was explaining these five languages, and she said, Gary, I can give you a perfect example of that. She said, several years ago when our baby was little, my husband got angry with our baby. She said he was about 12 to 18 months old, and he was crying. And he had done everything he could to get the baby to stop crying. The baby wouldn't stop crying. And finally, he got so angry, he picked up our baby and started shaking our baby. And when he did, she said, I grabbed our baby and said, don't do that to our baby. And I ran to our bedroom just sobbing. She said, 10 minutes later, he knocked on the door. And he asked if he could come in. And he opened the door and said, honey, I can't believe I did that. You know I love our baby. I can't believe I did that. I don't ever want to do that again. Can you help me?
Can we get a plan where I won't ever do that again? I don't ever want to do that again. She said, Dr. Chapman, I sensed his sincerity. And I said, honey, okay, let's talk. And we talked. We came up, she said, with a very simple plan that if he ever felt himself about to lose it with one of our children, he would turn to me and say, honey, I'm getting hot. I've got to take a walk. And he'd take a walk. And then 30 minutes later, he'd come back and say, he didn't take the whole evening off. He'd come back in 30 minutes and say, honey, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm calm down now. What can I do to help you? He'd plug back in. And she said, Dr. Chapman, that was eight years ago. He's never lost his temper with one of our children since then. He's taken several walks, but he's never lost his temper. You see, for some people, if you don't express the desire to change your behavior, then you haven't apologized. So these are the five languages of apology. Now, here, here's what I want to suggest, that each of us has a primary apology language. That is, one of these was taught to you by your parents growing up, and that's what you think a sincere apology is. And people can say the others, but you tend to judge them as being insincere if they don't express it in your language. So if you want to connect in the marriage and family, if you want to connect, you want to communicate your sincerity, you must learn to speak the other person's language. Now, I know you've never said some of those words before. You've never said I was wrong, and you'll argue, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not talking morally wrong. I'm talking about hurting the relationship. Maybe what you did was not morally wrong, but it's obvious it hurt the relationship. You know, I remember a, a few years ago, my wife, uh, I walked in one day, and uh, the chair which, on which I sat every morning to put my shoes on, she'd had it upholstered in a whole new thing. And I noticed it, yeah, and I sat down, you know. And then she walked in, and she said, Honey, how you like the chair? And I said, Well, honey, it's fine, honey. I said, But I... I think I really like the other one better. And she burst into tears. Look, you don't have any idea how much time I spent going all over this town trying to find the fabric to match the other fabric. And da 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 Now, folks, it was not a sin for me just to tell her what I thought. That was not a sin. But it was wrong. It was wrong. You know, in retrospect, it was wrong. It hurt my wife. And so I, I needed to say, not only I'm sorry, but honey, I was wrong. I should not have said that. I had, and of course, I told her I had no idea how much time she had spent, how much energy she had she'd spent on, on that, you know. So guys, just be careful, you know. I mean, <laughs> be careful. Your wife up posters a chair, you need to brag on it. <laughs> so some of us are going to have some learning to do in, in a marriage. We're going to have to learn how to, how to express an apology in a different way. I remember I was doing a workshop for single adults on this topic before the book ever came out. And after I finished the workshop, a young couple came up. They were, they were engaged to each other. And his name was Carl. And he said, uh, I'm not real glad I came to this thing. I said, really? Why? He said, well, he said, those languages, he said, uh, uh, she told me, because I did a little quiz with them. He said, she told me that... Uh, that her language was for me to say, I'm sorry. And he said, I've never said those words. He said, they sound kind of girly to me. He said, I don't, I don't know that I can say those words. He said, so how are we going to get along in our marriage if I can't apologize in her language? And I said, well, Carl, let me ask you a question. Have you ever done anything in your whole life that you sincerely regretted? He said, well, yeah. I said, well, could you tell me one? He said, well, he said, when my mother died, I came home for the funeral. And the night before the funeral, I went out to the bar. I was just going to get a drink, but I got drunk. And he said, I got so drunk that the next morning in my mama's funeral, I didn't remember anything that happened at the funeral. The whole thing was just a haze to me. And I've always regretted that because I love mama. And my mama was always on my case about drinking too much. And I just felt like I let mama down. And he said, I've always regretted that. I said, well, Carl, if you could talk to your mother right now, what would you say to her? And tears came to his eyes. He said, I'd tell her I'm sorry that I went out and got drunk the night before a funeral. I wish I hadn't gone to that bar in the first place. He said, I'm just telling her how sorry I am. I hope she knows I love her so much. And he just went on and on and on. And when he got through, I said, 
Carl, you know what you just did? He said, yeah, I told my mom I'm sorry. <laughs> and then he said, you think she heard me? <laughs> now, pastors, I don't know about the theology of this, <laughs> but I said to him, yeah, man, I think she heard you, and I think she forgave you. You know, the Bible does say there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. It didn't say the angels rejoice. It said rejoicing in the presence of the angels. So I think maybe his mama did hear him and mama, his mama forgave him. And uh, I said, Carl, you know what you just did? You just demonstrated. You can say the words, I'm sorry. He said, yeah, I can. He said, I'm so glad I came. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that couple a year later. They were married now, and they came to one of my marriage seminars. And I said to his wife, I said, listen, can, can Carl say I'm sorry? She said, oh, Dr. Chapman, he's such a good apologizer. He said, yeah, he can say I'm sorry. I said, does he speak your love language? She said, oh, Dr. Chapman, he knows, how to, he knows how to love me. And then I flipped it the other way around. And then here they are, one year into marriage, and they're getting, getting along great. Why? They learn two things. They learn how to love each other, and they learn how to deal with their failures effectively. Okay? Now, uh, how do you discover your primary apology language? If you want to know what your primary language is, how do you discover it? Well, let me suggest three questions you can ask. Ask yourself. Number one, when I apologize, what do I typically say or do? Just think about the last time you apologized. What did you say or do? If you can't remember the last time you apologized, you're overdue. <laughs> what do you normally do or say when you apologize? That's, that's one question. Here's the second question. What hurts me most deeply about this situation? If your spouse is trying to apologize to you, maybe they have apologized to you, and you're having trouble letting it go, ask yourself, what hurts me most deeply about this situation? If you say, what hurts me most deeply is, he won't admit that he's wrong. He said he was sorry, but he won't admit that he's wrong. You're telling yourself what your language is, accepting responsibility. If you say, what hurts me most is they don't make any offer to make things right. Yeah, they, he said he was sorry. She said she was sorry, and she said she was wrong, but she made no effort to make things up. You're telling yourself that your language is making restitution. So what hurts you most deeply about a given situation? And then question number three, what could they say or do that would make it easier for me to forgive them? If you've got something you're still having a time, hard time letting it go, what could they say or do that would make it easier for you to forgive them? If you answer those three questions, you, you will pretty well know what you consider to be a sincere apology, what your apology language is. Now, let's move to the second part of the whole equation because apology alone will never restore a relationship. It's apology and forgiveness that restores relationships. So let's look at forgiveness now. God is our model in forgiveness as in all other things. Listen to this verse, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. So we are to forgive each other in the same way that God forgives us. So how does God forgive us? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. God forgives us in response to our apology or, we, or our confession to God that we have sinned and we reach out to ask forgiveness of God. God doesn't forgive everybody. God does not walk around forgiving everybody of their sins. No. If we confess our sins, we turn from our sins, then God forgives our sins. Now, we are to forgive each other in the same way. Now, what is forgiveness? There are three Hebrew words and four Greek words that are translated forgiveness in the Old and New Testaments. But the primary, primary meaning of those words is to pardon or to take away. To pardon or to take away. Listen to these illustrations. Jeremiah, this is not on the screen. Jeremiah 31, verse 34 God said, I will forgive your sins and never again remember them against you. Forgive your sins and never remember them against you. That's pardon. Pardon. He's never going to hold them against you. Listen to this one. Psalm 103, verse 12. 
As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. He's taken our transgressions away. He's removed them from us. So that's essentially what the word means, to pardon or to take away. So forgiveness is a godly response to an apology. We're following God's example. It's a godly response to an apology. Now, let me just uh, be very honest with you because sometimes we have the idea that, that forgiveness erases everything and makes everything like it was before. Let me talk about what forgiveness does not do. Now, listen carefully to me. What forgiveness does not do. Number one, forgiveness does not destroy our memory. You've heard people say, perhaps, if you haven't forgotten, you haven't forgiven. That is not true. Everything that's ever happened to us is recorded in the brain. And when your spouse sins against you or your child sins against you or your parents sin against you, even if they come and apologize and even if you forgive them, you will still remember what happened. The memory will jump back in your mind from time to time. Secondly, forgiveness does not remove all painful emotions. When the memory comes back, the pain comes back. Sometimes it's hurt, sometimes it's disappointment, sometimes it's anger, but the emotion comes back when you have the memory. Now, let me pause to say, what are you going to do about that? When the memory comes back and the emotion comes back, and here you are remembering what they did, and, and you're feeling all these emotions again, what are you going to do with that? I suggest you take it to God, and you say, Lord, you know what I'm remembering tonight, and you know what I'm feeling again, but I thank you that that's forgiven. Now help me to do something good today. And you don't let the failures of yesterday mess up today. They apologize, you forgave them, the memory comes back, the pain comes back, you take it to God, and you say, you know what I'm remembering, you know what I'm feeling, but I thank you that I forgave them. Now help me to do something good today. And you don't allow the memory to, keep you, to, to control your behavior. Number three, forgiveness does not remove all the consequences of sin. You and our day, in some circles, we have preached so much the freedom of forgiveness, God will forgive you, God will forgive you, God will forgive you, that people have the idea it's not so, not so bad to sin because you just sin and enjoy it and then God will forgive you and everything's okay. Folks, there's a lot of consequences of sin that are not removed with forgiveness. God can forgive you, your spouse can forgive you, but the consequences are still there. For example, let's say that I, that I get drunk, and I'm driving my car drunk, and I have an accident, and my car gets messed up, and my leg gets broken. I can confess my sin to God right there in the car before the police get there, and God will forgive me, but my car's still messed up, and my leg's still broken. A father leaves his wife, runs off with another woman, leaves his kids, goes to another state, doesn't show up for 20 years. He gets converted, comes to know Christ, begins to change his life, comes back and apologizes to that wife, apologizes to his children. They may all forgive him, but that doesn't make up for the 20 years he lost. Are you with me? We get sexually involved in sexual sins and yes, God will forgive us for any sexual sin, but it doesn't take away the disease that we got through the sexual sin, and it doesn't take away the pain and the hurt and the scars that are still there that we have to live with for a lifetime. So sin is a serious business. We are never better for having sinned, but thank God there is forgiveness, and, and we, can be, we can walk with God, and we can walk with each other. Number four, Forgiveness does not rebuild trust. You've, I've heard people say in my office, particularly in cases where a husband or wife has been unfaithful to the other sexually, and now they've repented and come back and they're asking forgiveness and they're trying to rebuild, and the spouse will say, you know, well, you know, Dr. Chapman, I've forgiven him or I've forgiven her, but to be honest with you, I don't trust them. And I say, welcome to the human race. Forgiveness does not restore trust. Forgiveness opens the door to the possibility that trust can be reborn. You see, people lose trust in each other because they're untrustworthy. They broke the covenant. They were unfaithful. 
and so they, the person lost trust. It's regained by being trustworthy. So I say to a couple, if they're trying to rebuild their marriage after an affair, I say to the one who's been unfaithful, if you're serious and you want your spouse to come to trust you again, then your attitude needs to be, my cell phone is yours. Anytime you want to look at it, it's fine. My iPad is yours. I mean, I, and if I tell you I'm going over to George's house to help him work on his car, it's fine to call over there and see if I'm there. I am through with deceit. I'm going to be faithful to you. And, and, and what will happen if you follow that pattern in six months or nine months, they'll trust you again because you became trustworthy. So forgiveness does not restore trust. It opens the door to the possibility of trust being reborn. And number five, forgiveness does not always result in reconciliation. Most of the time it does. Reconciliation has to do with coming back to where the relationship can grow again. But you see, sometimes spouses have left each other in anger and hurt and all of that, and then both of them begin to work on their relationship with God, and they come back later and apologize and forgive each other, but they're already remarried to somebody else. They're not going to be reconciled, but they can forgive each other and then go on, you know. So, so don't, don't equate forgiveness with reconciliation, though most of the time reconciliation does le forgiveness does lead to reconciliation. Now, I want to I address a couple of issues that often come up. The first one is, what if a person does not speak your apology language? Your spouse, uh, they, they, they're apologizing, but they're not speaking your language. Well, here's what happens. By nature, we will question their sincerity. That's why in the past, you have often, or perhaps sometimes, questioned the sincerity of your spouse. They've apologized, but they didn't, they didn't speak your language, and you question their sincerity. That's just natural. But what I'm saying is this. By faith, you choose to forgive them. Now that you know there are different ways to apologize, give them credit. They're speaking the language their mother taught them. Give them credit. If he says he's sorry, give him credit. He's doing what he thinks and what he knows to do as an apology. So ideally, I want to encourage you to learn each other's apology language and apologize in the language that speaks to the heart. But what I'm also saying is if they don't, recognize there are different ways and you just say to yourself, okay, they're not speaking my language, but I'm sure it's the language his father taught him, his mother taught him, so I'm going to give them credit and I'm going to forgive them. Christians should always stand ready to forgive freely. Why? Because we have been given, forgiven freely by God. Now, second question, what if the person does not apologize? They don't apologize at all. They sin against you, they hurt you, but they don't apologize at all. The Bible's very clear. Here's what we do. Number one, we lovingly confront them. Lovingly confront them. Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17 says you confront them three times. First time, you confront them individually. Your husband sins against you, your wife sins against you. You go to them personally, you confront them, you say, Honey, I don't know what you think about this, but I am angry, I am hurt. What you did has deeply hurt me. You know, you're confronting them with hoping that they're going to apologize and you can forgive them. So you do that. But if they don't apologize, it says you take a friend with you and you go back. You might even take your son or daughter with you and you go back and you confront your spouse again. But if they still don't apologize, he says you, you go tell the pastor. And the pastor will get some of the leaders in the church and they'll go with you. And they'll confront them three times. And then he said, if they don't apologize, he didn't say forgive them. He said, you treat them as a pagan. What do you do for pagans? You pray for pagans. Mm -hmm. you, pray, you pray for pagans. And you hope that pagans are going to repent so you can forgive them. But he didn't say forgive them. You go three times and confront them. You see, in Luke 17, it's not on the screen, Luke 17, verse 3, Jesus said, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him, confront him, and if he repents, you forgive him. See, if he repents, you forgive him. You see, forgiveness is always a response to an apology. God doesn't forgive us until we apologize, until we confess. And the same thing's true on the human plane. We lovingly confront. So what do we do 
if they don't apologize, we've confronted them, they don't apologize, we're going to treat them now as a pagan, we'll start praying for them, that they'll come to repentance so we can forgive them. But secondly, we release the person to God. We turn them over to God. Let me give you an example from the life of Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, Peter is talking about Jesus, and he says, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. He committed himself to the one who judges righteously. He turned the people over to the Father who judges righteously. I'll give you another example. 2 Timothy, this is not on the screen, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says this, Alexander the coppersmith did me great evil. He sinned against me. The Lord, listen, the Lord will reward him accordingly. Keep an eye out for him because he'll also probably try to do you wrong. He didn't say he forgave him. He released him to God. He turned him over to God. Can I just, can I just share this with you? Because so many people in our generation have been hurt, I think, by, by some of us who are pastors and counselors who have good intentions, but we're not biblical. Uh, and, and here's where this happens so often. Let me say that a husband is unfaithful to his wife, and so she confronts him, and he denies it, and then she gets the goods, and now he's caught, and he said, well, okay, but if you think I'm going to stop this, you're crazy. You can do what you want to do. I'm not going to change my behavior. And so somebody else goes with and confronts, and the church confronts, and he's still living uh, in sin with the other person. And, and this wife has held all this inside as long as she can, and she's got all this hurt and everything's going on, and she goes to see a pastor or a counselor, and the counselor says, you know, you've got to get rid of this. If you don't, if you don't forgive him, it's going to kill you. Forgive him? He's still living in sin. But if you don't forgive him, it's going to kill you. Now, I know, I know what the counselor's trying to do. The counselor's trying to help her get rid of the anger and all that stuff inside, and, and, and she needs to get rid of that because the Bible says don't hold anger inside. We've got to release the person to God and release the anger to God. But you see, she goes home now feeling more guilty because she's been told that she needs to forgive him. And my question is this, has God forgiven him? Not if he's still living in sin. God has not forgiven him. And, and the counselor's asking her to do something God hasn't done. Are you with me? And so what I'm saying is this. No, we don't forgive them. We release them to God. Lord, I've confronted. I've done everything I know, and they still aren't coming back. They're still living in sin. I turn them over to you. I love them. I want to I forgive them. I will forgive them if they ever want to be forgiven I stand ready to forgive them but I turn them over to you and so we release our hurt release our anger to God so we can go on and live our lives you with me now when I say that sometimes people say Gary wait a minute what about Jesus on the cross father forgive them for they know not what they do and I say yeah but now remember that was a prayer not a proclamation he wasn't pronouncing them forgiven. He was praying to the Father that they would be forgiven. And later on, remember the day of Pentecost? Peter preached and said, you kill the Son of God, and you need to repent. And the Bible says many of them repented, and many of the priests repented. That's when Jesus' prayer was answered. When they repented, then they received the forgiveness of God. So Jesus wasn't pronouncing them forgiven. He was praying. That's why he was dying, so they could be forgiven. He wants all men to repent, the Bible says. But not all men do repent, and so they, they, not all men are forgiven. Number three, after we release them to God, we pray for them, and we stand ready to forgive them. Always ready to forgive them. Always ready. Whenever they come back, whenever they turn, whenever they come back and apologize and repent, then we stand ready to forgive them. A Christian must always be willing to forgive because God is always willing to forgive. And then number four, and I'm going to tell you, you don't, have a, you don't have a ghost of a chance of doing number four without the help of God. Number four, you return good for evil. You return good for evil. Romans chapter 12. Do not take revenge, but on the contrary. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. 
Now, some people read that and say, well, that's what I want to do, put those burning coals on their head. And they missed the whole point. They didn't have matches in those days. Everybody had their, their, their little burning coals in their, in their hot hut, you know. Everybody had, and if, you, if your coal went dead, and then you had to go to your neighbor's house and get some hot coals. And then put it in a jar and put it on your head and take it back. It was giving good. It wasn't bad. wasn't bad. The whole thing is you overcome evil by doing good. I remember the wife who said to me, Gary, my husband left me for another woman. And I was so hurt and I was so angry. And I confronted him, and others confronted him, and he just continued. And one day I read this passage in Romans chapter 12, returning good for evil, and God said to me, I want you to bake him his favorite pie and take it over there to that apartment where he's living and give it to him. And she said, I said, God, if I made that pie and went over there, I'd throw it in his face. (laughs) And she said, I wrestled with God for about three days, and finally I just said, okay, God, If that's what you want, that's what I'll do. She said, I baked that pie. I took it over to his apartment. I knocked on the door. He came to the door. He was behind the screen door. And I told him, I said, I was praying the other day, and God impressed on me that I should bake you a pie and bring it to you, so I'm giving you a pie. And he opened the door and took the pie, and he said, oh, that's very kind of you. And he closed the door and went back in the apartment. She said, Gary, that was the first step in the two-year process of our reconciliation. I hate to think what would have happened if I'd never baked the pie. You see, returning good for evil is one of the most powerful things you can do for somebody who sinned against you and is still sinning against you, is returning good for evil. It's the biblical pattern, and it's what God will give us the power to do. So can I make it personal? Let me ask you four questions. Will you ask these of yourself? Whom do I need to forgive? Is there a family member that you need to forgive? They've apologized. Maybe you think it's not sincere. Whom do I need to forgive? A son or a daughter, a mother or a father, a husband or a wife, or maybe someone else. Second question. Whom do I need to lovingly confront? They have sinned. You know they've sinned, and you're just going on, and you're not confronting them with it. They're not apologizing, and you're not confronting. It's your, it's your turn. If they're not apologizing, then you, who do I need to confront? See, children sometimes need to confront their parents and say, Mama, the way you talked to me, I don't think that was very Christian. And it gives Mama a chance to say, Honey, you're right. I was wrong. Whom do I need to confront? Third third question, whom do I need to release to God? I've done everything I can. I've reached out. I've, I've, I've tried to make it easy for them to apologize and confess and repent, but they haven't. Whom do I need to release to God and not allow the anger and the hurt and the, all that to stay inside of me any longer? Release them, release my anger to God. And question number four, to whom do I need to apologize? Is there a family member that you need to apologize to? It can be the first step in the process of them forgiving you so the relationship can go forward. I remember some time ago, a young man came to my office and he said, Gary, he said, "Uh, I've been a Christian two years. I've been studying the Bible. I've been trying to grow. And he said, "Uh, I have a brother We had a falling out 15 years ago over a car deal. And both of us felt the other person was wrong. And we haven't spoken to each other in 15 years. And he said, now that I'm a Christian, I've been studying the Bible, it just doesn't seem right to me that two brothers ought to live in the same town and not speak to each other. And he said, I'm just trying to figure out what I need to do. So we talked on, and I got the story from him, and I said, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I believe the Bible teaches, and that is that you need to go to him and apologize for your part in that deal and especially to apologize to him that you've stayed away for 15 years and haven't spoken to him. And I said, I don't know, I don't know your brother's apology language, so why don't you and I sit down here and try to just write up a little apology that will include all five languages. 
that you can say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and you want to make it up to him, and you know you don't want this to have ever happen again, and, and ask his forgiveness. So we, we, we just drew up a little apology that covered all the bases. I said, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to call your brother on the telephone and just say, I was wondering if I could come by and see you. And I said, if he says no way or if he hangs up on you, that's okay. Six weeks later, you call him again and ask the same question. Could I come by and see you? And I said, we'll talk. If he says no, we'll talk. And I said, but if he says yes, you come back and we'll talk, okay? So first phone, first phone call, he asked his brother, I was just calling to see if I could come by and see you. Fifteen years of silence. And his brother said, yeah, that'd be okay. <laughs> yeah, that'd be okay. So they set a time. And he called me. He was all excited. He said, oh, Dr. Chapman, he said, come by. I said, okay. I said, let's talk. I said, now listen, when you get over there, you knock on his door. And when your, when your brother comes to the door, don't you start talking about the weather. Don't you start talking about sports. See, that's what men talk about, weather and sports. Don't you talk about the weather. Don't you talk about sports. As soon as he opens the door, you say to him, I have come to apologize. I said, if he stands still, you just give your apology. And that's what he did. And when he finished his apology, his brother opened the door, walked out on the porch, grabbed him, and started sobbing and said, you don't know how many times I've wanted to come to you and apologize, but I was not man enough to do it. And they sobbed and wept with each other. And then they started talking and catching up on each other's family. And, and the brother said, why don't you come over Friday night and let's have a cookout and let's get our families together again. And now they started having cookouts once a week for several weeks, and the whole thing was resolved. One apology led to the resolution of a 15-year fracture in a family relationship. Folks, listen. Life is too short to live with fractured relationships in the family. Whether it's a husband, a wife, or a parent and a child. And listen, as parents, if you have adult children that are estranged from you and, and they've, they've been mean to you and all that, I urge you to find them and apologize to them. No, it wasn't all your fault, but apologize for your part in it. And, 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 and reach out to them and see if they'll forgive you. And, and we can rebuild relationships. Uh, but we will never have long-term healthy relationships in a family if we don't learn to apologize and then choose to forgive. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the clarity with which your word speaks to us about relationships. I pray that you would teach us how to love each other and teach us how to deal effectively with our failures so that we can have long-term, healthy marriages and family relationships. And I pray for this church as they focus on family in the coming weeks and have different speakers coming in on different topics. Father, by your Spirit, continue to touch their hearts so that your purposes can be accomplished in this place in the name and to the glory of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I was sitting there listening as Dr. Chapman was speaking. I don't know of anyone who have, could come in here and give, build such a great foundation about the family as you have tonight. And I am so grateful. Let's again give another great hand of applause. Yes. Yes. Wonderful information. Great information. Yes. Yes. We're just so grateful for God to permit us to just sit under the anointing and the wisdom that God has given you over the years at this church and we all can grow from that. And I know that I've heard many talk on the family, but you have information that is so directly involved and practical information that makes us a better fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters. Let's prepare our hearts for a great offering this afternoon, uh, this evening, in Jesus' name, offering time. And My JC's friend Al came over tonight to give us a million dollars tonight.
He's the money man. He's Mr. Money.